Okay, welcome everyone to our next session. Uh, this is a, pan a panel, um, Publishers and the COVID-19 Challenge, New Monetization Strategies for 2020. It's been developed with our partner Embolden, who we greatly appreciate for not only organizing the content, but also recruiting the speakers for this particular panel. Uh, the panel moderator is Rachel uh, Pasqua. I hope I pronounced that correctly. And uh, she is the CMO of Embolden. And I will turn things over to you, Rachel. Thank you so much, Casey. So thanks for having us. Embolden is delighted to participate and support Mobile Growth Summit. Um, my panelists today are also members of the uh, Global Embolden Network. So I'd like to ask them to introduce themselves. Uh, Michelle, would you like to start? Yeah, sure. Hi. Uh, so uh, I'm uh, Michelle Webb. I am the VP of US Growth and I am programmatic. Um, specifically spearheading SMATICS, um, and I'm also the co-president of Embolden for the LA chapter. Super. And Katie? Hi, yeah, I'm Katie Wilson. I'm the founder and CEO of Tap On It. We're a message tech company based in Davenport, <laughs> um, and yeah, I'm excited to be here and chat with you guys. Terrific. All right, thanks, ladies. So without further ado, um, the organizers asked us to talk today about the impact of COVID-19 and arguably much many other things that are that are shaking the country up and um, how it's affecting publishers and, and what strategies publishers can put in place to improve monetization during these difficult times. So to, to tee that up, and um, we've already introduced ourselves, so I'll, I'll move past our lovely pictures. Um, First, the consumers. We know that this has had a drastic and obvious impact on consumer behavior. People are at home, people are in quarantine, and uh, as a result, they're consuming exponentially more content. 87% uh, of US consumers are consuming much more content across more media channels. Um, it's also interesting to note that this behavior is likely to stick, and those consumption levels, they might not end up being quite that high in the, in the long run, but will continue to be elevated past past levels. And also interesting to note, according to Kantar in May 2020, uh, only 5% of US consumers have any reservations about advertising and feel that brands should stop advertising because of the, the struggles that the country's going through. So that's definitely an interesting point. Um, unfortunately, that's not that consumer receptivity to con brands continuing to advertise isn't necessarily reflected on the advertiser side. We know that almost a quarter of advertisers have paused all spend for Q1 and Q2. Significant number, almost 50%, have adjusted their spend for the same period. Um, for almost everyone, it's going to impact upfront spend, um, a 20% increase. And this is all from the IAB studies that were run across consumers, advertisers, and publishers from um, March to, to May. Um, and almost everyone has reforecast their budgets through June with a, a significant number of buyers pausing ad spend altogether. All of which leads to a really difficult catch-22 for publishers. They have more eyeballs than ever before, but less of an opportunity to monetize. Um, digital revenues, according to IB, are down 19 to 25%. That's from April. I, I think if they, they pulled them now, we might see a lower number. That actually seems overly optimistic or overly rosy. Um, 98% expect an overall decrease in revenue in 2020. It's pretty much what you would expect. Um, and it's hitting news publishers, ironically, because they're probably seeing the most increase in readership, hitting news publishers more than anyone else. Um, so obviously publishers are facing a, a really difficult market. Um, it's, it's hitting them more than anyone else. So, so what can they do? So in our discussions, uh, the three of us, we've the first thing that came to, to mind was the, the concept of subscriptions and paywalls. We are seeing, and this is interesting, but also pretty much what you would expect, because people are hungry for content, they're more receptive to the idea of paying for it. So higher receptivity to subscription models, to paywall models. So first question for you ladies, for publishers who are doing both, does it make sense for them to increase their paywalls, increase their the, the pricing models of paywalls and subscriptions, um, or for publishers who've never done this in the past, is now the time for them to start thinking about these models. Um, thoughts? Yeah, um, I can jump in uh, first. So 
being that Somatics is a DSP, you know, we have the benefit of working with a lot of different types of advertisers and also publishers. Um, and interestingly enough, um, the advertisers that we've seen increase spend have been primarily in the subscription model um, sector, whether or not they're in the finance vertical, the um, uh, at home fitness or education vertical. Um, even things like hunting apps has also seen an increase, right, with pretty heavy uh, annual subscriptions. And so, um, you know, that's given us some insights into the fact that people are willing to not only spend more in app for apps that make sense to their lifestyle right now, but will definitely subscribe and renew month over month. And so, um, you know, if, if it makes sense for a publisher to incorporate more of that or different types of pay options for their uh, users, they could also benefit from this change in, um, in spend behavior. My thought would be more on the consumer side because um, so for tap on it, we are, like I said, message tech. We right now we focus mainly in the text messaging space. And so, um, you know, with that, it is a 100% opt in database. And so it's a little bit different. And so when I look at paying for content and paywalls and subscriptions, I think it's all about making sure that the content is high quality and it continues to be month after month after month, because I may sign up for it now, but what are we going to do to keep and retain those people? And um, publishers have an excellent opportunity to um, be heard right now. And as long as the content stays high quality, I think they're going to be able to continue to grow that way. I, I would hope so. I think when we were we were talking before the session, we, we touched on the idea of the Guardian being so forthright in their paywall model, asking people to contribute and, and being very, very earnest about the fact that to continue to provide their readers with the level of content that they're used to, they need to to offset that cost in some way. So I think for publishers, if you know, for a publisher, I can see there being a fear factor in thinking, well, is now really the time to put up to put up a paywall when people we know that people need access to content and are hungry for it? Will that be seen as perhaps mercenary? I don't know. My personal thinking is if they are very forthright about the fact that look, advertisers spending less, the whole country is hurting, the economy is not in a good place, but we want to continue providing you with with the level of service we've always provided. That that this is something that could work and is worth exploration. Yeah, I think that's a good point you make because how often have we heard friends of ours or family members outside of the interest in, uh, industry complain about ads, right? Or complain about, you know, but yet they're super happy to use the free app. And so whenever I have those personal conversations, I try to educate people about, you know, the nature of the free app and what that means and how many people are employed by these companies creating great games or content. So I think a similar conversation, you, to your point, Rachel, is needed from um, those those apps to their users in cases like this, right? We're all going through something in the background as companies, as humans. Um, so I think I think that's correct because it could be perceived opportunistic or in a negative way. Um, but I think with that context and communication, um, that could make all the difference. Well, yeah. part of it is the pricing, right? Like if you think about it, it's it's about the pricing because if it's a low enough number where I'm like, yeah, of course I would pay that. It also sets it up so that it's automatically withdrawn, right? From my mm -hmm. my account, right? And so people forget. And uh, you know, I know maybe that seems sneaky or something, but it's not. They forget that they're going to be getting two bucks or whatever it is withdrawn from their account, which allows these businesses, these publishers to have that recurring revenue and to continue to provide the content. And which for most paywalls, it's going to be, enough. obviously, when we were talking earlier, um, Shal, I think you mentioned, you know, you have customers that have subscription models that are up to in the hundreds of dollars, um, but most of them are negligible amounts. And it's this reminds me, the IAB on the IAB Mobile Center of Excellence last year, we were, um, we were doing the regular DC flying where you go and you talk to uh, you talk to the senators on Capitol Hill and you talk to them about how privacy legislation will affect the industry and how it will affect consumers. And one of the stats that we prepared was, and I forget where the number came from. It might've been IAB research, but the amount of free content that the average American consumes, if they have had to pay for it, would come up to an average of about, I think it was $1,200 a year. Just an eye-opening amount. 
Yeah. So, yeah. So I think if, if publishers are clear that it's a negligible amount and it will help them keep the lights on and keep serving their customers, that it's a, it, it's worthy of exploration. And maybe now's the time for this model to come into its own. So, okay. So uh, we don't spend all of our time on paywalls. So on to diversification of demand sources. So we know that, you know, if you're, if you're, percentage of your revenue is going down if you increase the number of demand sources that you have ideally that will offset that decrease one would hope um but it's it's much bigger than that it's not just about volume so michelle do you want to um weigh in on some of the ideas we talked about yeah yeah um i think it's it's more important than ever to realize that there are specialized um ssps and uh, monetization partners so for example in app you know, Mopub could be a great resource. Uh, if you have native, whether or not it's in-app or web, Triple Lift is another great resource, right? And some of these are super specialized, whether or not it's um, rewarded video, video in general, um, you know, and, and each one will have its nuances. And so diversifying how you monetize with various, um, you know, SSP partners, I think is is key because if you have all your eggs in one basket in any scenario, it's not a good idea. But right now, in particular, because you may be missing out on some demand that could be a significant impact on your bottom line. And thoughts on like, does that does does this type of diversification strategy? What type of what's the word I'm looking for? What's what's the level of effort on the publisher's part to actually put this kind of thing into play? I mean, of course, it takes human resources, right? So you have to have someone dedicated to monetization, most likely, and have kind of a team organized around that. Um, I know for some publishers, they have their demand and, uh, sorry, their marketing all kind of under one hub. So they do monetization and user acquisition all together, branding all together. But the shops that have it more segmented, have a specialist in monetization, um, definitely, I think, would have an easier time. So if you don't already have somebody carved out or at least somewhat dedicated to this, I think, um, you know, that's super important. And then depending on who you're integrating with, it's pretty seamless. I mean, a lot of these SSPs have made it, I mean, onboarding extremely easy. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, you vet them like you would any other vendor that you, you know, that you might consider. Um, look at the contracts, look at the terms, look at um, their onboarding process, documentation. Um, so, yeah, I'm, it does take a resource for sure. So. <laughs> so probably an easier, easier strategy for a bigger publisher, but but hopefully doable for anyone. Katie, anything you want to add about diversification? You know, again, I mean, ours, our platform is different. We're focusing on texting. And so one of the things that we often talk about is um, building new audiences. And so for publishers to consider building a messaging database of their readers, it gives them a new way to reach um, additional readers and a different audience. Also, text messages have a 98, 99% open rate. I mean, even if it's to get that little red one to go away. I looked at my phone earlier, I have 17,000 unread emails and I have four unread text messages, right? It's controllable. And so um, considering that you can easily start building databases via text message and that as long as you tell people what they're going to get and then you're consistent and provide what you've said, um, they tend to stick with it and the open rates are very high. Um, with the images in the text thread, it's guaranteed visibility and it gives you a new place not only to communicate and to um, repurpose your content, but also to offer ad units for businesses. So I just, I see it as a um, an additional opportunity that um, hasn't necessarily been taken into consideration as much on the content side. And in a lot of cases, it's really just brands that are building these lists. But the same type of content that gets pushed out in an email campaign or on our publishers' websites, in a lot of cases, people would want to have easily accessible in a text. Yeah, indeed. And I think that that plays into the concept of messaging as content, it plays into some of the other things that we were talking about. I think our next, our next concept was uh, diversification of ad formats. We know that post-COVID people are consuming more video, especially more streaming video, obviously um, more news than ever before, um, more mobile content, more gaming, more social. Uh, apparently, and, and we talked about this on a personal level when we were prepping for the call, 
we're e-commerce. We're all spending more online, but by necessity. But again, that's a habit that we're doing it by necessity because of quarantine, but it's a habit that's likely to stick at those elevated levels. So concept here from, from a publisher perspective, um, what can they do to think about diversifying the types of inventory they offer to, to appeal to these new consumption habits and by proxy appeal to, uh, appeal to advertisers? Sure. Um, I can answer this uh, to start. Also, just to throw this out there to the audience, um, it feels so strange not being able to see your faces. Uh, but uh, if you have questions, um, there is a Q&A section. Please add your questions there. Mm -hmm. We'll try to answer them uh, during the chat. If not, we can definitely answer them um, at the end. Uh, but one of the things I want to point out that's definitely related to uh, ad formats and diversifying is that um, though there's been a huge decline in brand advertising and branding in general, um, most of which kind of plateaued mid-April, um, there's been a steady incline, uh, an increase from performance advertisers. And so, you know, with uh, less risk tolerance, that makes sense. Um, brands need, whether or not they're apps or, or traditional brands, um, they need to see a return on their investment more quickly. And so we've seen a big uptick in certain verticals within performance advertising and um, ad units that appeal to those types of demand uh, partners are definitely going to be more valuable right now. Um, so if you've traditionally had more uh, large format, uh, interstitials, other types of um, more you know brand centric uh, plays, you may want to consider changing that. Um, you know, a lot of small banner units, a lot of um, video, a lot of playables um, are, are kind of winning right now in terms of where the dollars are going on our platform. So, you know, we may be buying from, um, I don't know, probably 15 SSPs right now, uh, but there are some that are for sure winning more of our advertisers' dollars and in particular in, in certain ad formats. And, and it's sort of global, right? It's not specific to one geo. We're seeing this trend globally, all tier one, LATAM. Um, and uh, yeah, so. Great, and then thank you for that. We did have one question come in from Dave Weston. Thank you, Dave. Um, asking if we'd seen certain ad work units working better or certain communication vehicles being more effective. I think we've. We've answered that there are certain units that are more successful. There's more of an emphasis on performance. And you kindly answered the geo question. Katie, I know you had more to add here. Yeah, um, I 100% agree that we're going to see less brand um, revenue. And we've already seen that happen. And I think we're going to continue to see that for a while. And so um, ROI and results is really what everybody's looking for at this point. And so you know, making sure that these ads with a strong call to action are something that's going to resonate well with the consumers. And one of the things that we're talking about a lot right now with the advertisers that we work with are that people are looking for a couple different things. Are you still open? What kind of services do you offer? What have you done to keep the business safe, especially when we're talking about driving in store or, you know, local business traffic? What have you done to keep me safe? What have you done to keep your staff safe? And then what's in it for me? You know, we have to consider that not only our business is being hit hard, but people are being hit hard here and budgets are sharing and market share or budgets are changing and market share is changing. And so people are going to be looking for discounts and they're looking for savings opportunities. And so, you know, considering that it may take giving a little bit in order to get people into your business is something to really keep top of mind. And then once they get there, the experience is so incredibly important. Um, people are worried and they're in some cases a little judgy <laughs> right now. And so making sure that they have an awesome experience to keep them coming back. And so I think that part of what we have an opportunity and also, uh, I mean, we need to be doing with any of these advertisers is coaching them on how not only are they gonna see a return out of their investment, but how do they you know, really retain long-term value from that? And that goes all the way down to the people who end up within their business. Yeah. Right. So not about the form, not, not just about shifting your, your strategy around formats, but also the messaging is, is key. 100%. And very much about, about performance and utility for everyone. Next. And this was an interesting one. So diversification, 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 and that, that lends itself to audiences too. Again, you know, increase your your pool of of audiences. Increase your more importantly, increase your pool of 
available data and you're going to enrich the value of your offering. Um, so thoughts on this one, ladies, um, audience and data. So I mentioned earlier that if you can have more audiences in different places, clearly that's going to give you an opportunity to monetize as well. And um, one of our big focuses is on first party data and um, the text messaging space is extremely well regulated because we don't want it to turn into spam, right? We don't want to feel our inbox to look like our email inbox when it comes to text. And so um, it's, it gives, publishers or brands or advertisers an opportunity to build a database that they own and of first party permission based users. And that is a very, very high quality engaged audience that gives you an opportunity to honestly charge more to reach them. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, looking at building not only different audiences, but new audiences can um, really give you a brand new revenue stream. Definitely. Yeah. And I agree. And, and I think, um, you know, there's different ways to monetize your data, right? You can you can do that on your own by um, by reaching them directly uh, in very targeted ways, but you can also do that through integrating with the DMP. Um, actually, our parent company, Intravision, has a DMP called Data Expand that we use primarily for um, web publishers. But there are a lot of other DMPs out there specific to managing your data and also selling your data. So that could be an additional. Uh, revenue source for you um, that you may not have thought about. Um, there's a lot of advertisers who are interested in things like, you know, finding a female audience, right? Gender is mm -hmm. one of the most difficult things outside of social channels um, to target because most of the time it's more, um, you know, uh, sort of a patchwork to, to find the right signals to identify a, a female versus you know, opt-in data that someone has supplied. And so, um, you know, just to give that as an example, right, if you have an onboarding form for your users to register, um, perhaps asking different questions that aren't too intrusive, but could potentially help you organize your data in a way that's more sellable. Okay. All right, we have one or two more thoughts and we could open to questions. Um, PMPAs and direct deals, and we, we talked in our, our preparation for the session about how these seem like a foregone conclusion, but perhaps they're not leveraged as much as they could be and why they're valuable at this point in time. Michelle, you want to start off with this one? Yeah, sure. So, um, yeah, it's funny. I, I feel like PMPs were like the hot buzzword maybe five years ago even, you know, where uh, everyone was talking about doing them and wanted to do them. And, and then they kind of, I think, fell off. For, for a bit there. And we've done a bit of a, um, you know, kind of blow, add a new life to this initiative at our company. Um, Smatics is able to, you know, transparently show with our clients where we're buying inventory, both at the SSP level and at the publisher level. And so we're having those one-on-one -on -one conversations with demand sources. And like, if this is a high performing publisher for you, would you pay X? And how much would you be able to commit in terms of, um, you know, a, a static budget just for this particular buy. And uh, and then we go and find that publisher to kind of connect the dots in the background and make sure that both are getting a better yield. Um, and I think a lot of DSPs are doing that right now and publishers should be more open to those conversations. Um, additionally, there are deal IDs that are being bundled um, or inventory is being bundled under specific deal IDs at SSPs. So, uh, again, Mopub is a good example. They have um, curated deal IDs right now so that advertisers can buy more efficiently in certain buckets of inventory. So leveraging your SSP and DSP um, partners to kind of connect these dots and make sure you're selling at the right volume and at the right price to win some of these very large advertiser budgets, you know, that are increasing in some cases 100 percent, 50 percent month over month, even during this crisis. Yeah, I definitely agree on that one. And uh, I'd say Michelle is more the expert in this type, in that type of question. Agreed. And um, last, uh, we've talked, we started out talking about the subscription model and being able to offer, publishers being able to monetize so they can continue to offer the same level of quality. Um, well, we also talked about the idea of perhaps shifting content strategy along with ad formats to ensure that you're offering, you know, utility and you're offering the types of, of content that consumers 
guys are looking for. Um, any additional thoughts we want to close on on, on Im improving on-site and in-app experiences? Obviously, people are spending more time now. They're consuming more content um, just because of behavior. But are there things that we can do, things that we can consider to, um, to further enrich that publisher experience? My biggest suggestion is just make it as easy as possible. So whatever the message is that you're pushing out, make sure that wherever it's linking, it's it ties back directly to that. So, you know, what with the businesses that we work with in the messaging space, you know, if you're going to tell someone or provide content on a specific item or you're going to, you know, try and sell a specific brand, um, making sure that the link that's within the text takes them to that direct um, piece of content is really important because we all have very short attention spans. Yeah. And uh, if you don't make it simple, you're gonna lose it. You're gonna lose people. Right, and for you, coming from the messaging space, it's gotta be such an interesting time because I think the concept of messaging being an extension of your con your brand and your content strategy is going to come to the forefront again. Um, and the idea of web push and app push as part of that to, to lead consumers back and help them find the right content Right. is is going to be more prominent and, and more brands that haven't explored it in the past will be exploring it. I, I hope so, um, because it, it, it's easy and it it's direct and it works. It works. It works. Michelle, any thoughts from you on this, this last point? Um, only that um, a lot of our advertisers who both buy and sell um, to us, they they're talking to us frequently about how they're investing more right now in um, the UI and in-app uh, experiences for their users. And in some cases, like they've moved marketing dollars just to this, right? So maybe they were spending on branding and now they're increasing, um, you know, engineering bandwidth and, and other uh, resources because to our point many times here, right? Not only um, having tactics to monetize, but having tactics to keep your users, make sure mm -hmm. your uh, you're putting your best foot forward um, because if you don't have a good product, ultimately they're not going to stay and you won't sell ads. So, you know, there's, there's this dynamic there that like uh, the, the best products will win right now. And those with a seamless uh, interface, those with good core values also, and that communicate well and establish a relationship with their users. Um, and this ties into the, the UI and UX enhancements. Mm -hmm. So experience and content matter more than ever now. Mm -hmm. All right, so we have less than two minutes for questions. So, so sorry everyone, but I, we had so many interesting things to talk about. We do have a question in already, but anyone else who's on, on the webinar who, who have question, quiz questions, please feel free to submit through the Q&A panel. The first question we have was from Farhad. He says that he's heard a lot of talk from publishers advising brands not to blacklist, co blacklist COVID and coronavirus terms. And just so you know, Farhad, we actually had a slide in here about this, about keyword strategy, but we thought we had too much content. So apologies, we took that one out. Um, he says this seems like self-serving advice. And, and uh, obviously I can, I can understand that, that that might be the perspective on the advertiser's behalf. Um, so what's our take on whether or not advertisers should blacklist those terms? I mean, personally, from my own experience in the agency world, I, I understand. I, I, I can't imagine any of my clients in the past across any vertical would would want their ads to appear next to you know sad, disturbing, or or otherwise incendiary content around around what's going on with the pandemic. So thoughts here. I know this isn't something we discussed at length, and it's more more subjective, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I can just speak to the fact of you know what I see my advertisers doing uh, or not doing, right? And only in those cases where their brand is very sensitive to perception in particular of uh, parents or I wouldn't even necessarily how to segment who they're sensitive to, but um, only a handful of advertisers are actually blacklisting this. The majority are still leaving bidding more to the open uh, market. Uh, and I'm sorry, did you, would you say right?